So what are we to make of this legacy? Well, I want to assess the predispositions, the leads he provides, the mode of inquiry and pre presentation and his closures. The predisposition. The first one, and I suppose the one that I've found most useful as a researcher, is the uh, notion of the power of paradox. If you really want to understand something, you've really got to identify what appears to be a prima facie anomaly in the data or a prima facie anomaly in, in the immediate problem before you. And by exploring what appears to be a prima facie paradox and unpicking it, you can really deepen your analysis of what's going on. By starting from the point that there's not an obvious answer, you create, a, a, if you like, a predisposition to thinking about things in a more creative way. But I suppose the second predisposition of Marx that I find most satisfying of all is one identified by John McMurtry, a Canadian Marxist. And he makes the very simple but uh, important point that before Marx came along, none of the great philosophers ever had asked the question, why do we have to have the private property system we have? I mean, Aristotle, Socrates, um, Machiavelli, Spinoza, these are great names, but none of them ever put up there as one of the really big questions in life, why do private property relations have to be the way they are, and turn that into a, a, an object of intense scrutiny. This is uh, probably his most profound um, contribution because it opens up a huge amount of space. And if I can just give an example of how this plays out practically. In uh, the late 1970s, it was quite clear that the Western capitalist world was in deep crisis. Uh, we all know about the rise of stagnation, stagflation and the like. Because uh, the Swedish labour movement was um, advised by uh, essentially a Marxist uh, called Rudolf Meidner, supported by um, Gosta Rehn, they, uh, they were quite happy to say, well, we've done our best, we've run a really uh, imaginative and creative Keynesian strategy, it's clear that this isn't working. Obviously the problem is the relations of production. And they said, what we've got to do is that the bosses are basically blowing the surplus, we've got to take it away from them, and we've got to have these things called wage earner funds. So they said to solve the crisis of the 1970s, we've got to have a tax on supernormal profits so that the surplus that is created by society is ploughed back into society in a sustainable way. Great idea. Unfortunately, the Swedish Social Democrats lost power for the first time in 50 years when they ran on this platform. But it does give you an idea of the, the power of um, Marx's uh, ways of reasoning that it can open up options for policy. And I can tell you now the whole issue of wage earner funds and questions about what we do with the social surplus are now back quite squarely on centre stage because over the last 10 years the profit share of GDP has increased by 10 percentage points. It's gone from about 20% of GDP to 30% of GDP. And the question is, where did the money go? That's a very basic question. 10 percentage points of GDP is a huge amount of wealth. And because Marx questioned those uh, assumptions, he allows us to really put those ideas forward. What about the analytical leads uh, that Marx put forward? Well, here I think the idea of production and social surplus is very, very critical. And I want to give you an example from work my centre did uh, several years ago, looking at the rise of non-standard employment and the accumulation based on deepening inequality. As you all know, in Australia today, we have a, uh, a big problem of casual work. We have a big problem of rising contractors. In fact, today, around 40% of the workforce is either a casual or a contractor, up from 20% only 20 years ago. How are we to make sense of this? Well, Robert Brenner argues that one of the key dynamics at work in, um, the over the last half decade has been a crisis in excess capacity. When you have a crisis in excess capacity, you have basically a situation where the world can produce more than it can consume. The classic case is the car industry. The Economist, the Economist magazine, not known for its allegiance to Marxism, has uh, argued for many years, and this is going back at least uh, 12 or 15 years, that the world car industry could produce a third more cars than it can sell. Right? If, you want to, if you want to get an image of it, you could shut down the entire US car industry and still have all the cars you needed. And that has continued. If anything, that problem of excess capacity in cars has got worse. And that is not just applicable to cars, that's in every branch of manufacturing and you see it in services as well. In retail, there is more floor space 
for people trying to sell goods than there are people who are prepared to buy them. So this squeezes profits. Not only is there a squeeze on profits, there's been a redistribution in those profits. This is data that Brenner put together. And Robert Brenner, by the way, is that guy I spoke to earlier. He was looking at the relation to movement from feudalism to capitalism in Western Europe. He thought that was a bit self-indulgent and said he should uh, apply his immense historical talents to understanding the modern world economy. So he's got the, these data together. He argues that you, uh, if you look at the um, distribution of profits in US manufacturing, and this is fairly typical across the Western world, in the 50s and 60s, 75% of profits were kept as retained earnings, 25% went out in dividends, and 0.1% went out in interest. By the time we get to the 1990s, 40% are kept as retained earnings, 36% go out as dividends, and 24% go out in interest. That's what a financialised capitalist economy looks like. Now, that, and remember, this, not only do you have the squeeze on profits with excess capacity, you then have the further squeeze on profits with the distribution of them away from retained earnings and out to the finance sector. How does that play out? Well, these pressures on firms mean that they are asking themselves all the time, how can we keep the show ticking over? How can we keep our workplace functioning? Let's think of a um, service station. If you're running a service station, you can't go to Shell and say, I'm having a hard time with my rate of profit, can you sell me the petrol cheaper? Shell will just give you a laugh. What's the one thing the service station owner can control? Their labour force. And this is where you see the, the major force behind the pressure to change uh, employment forms. You see the rise in part-time work and in particular you see the rise of temporary and permanent work. Sorry, the rise in temporary work at the expense of permanent work. But it doesn't end there. Change the structure of households, sorry, change the structure of employment and you change the structure of households. So whereas in the past we had an economy that was based on households with permanent uh, labour, increasingly it's based on contingent labour, that doesn't just change the structure of households, it changes the composition of demand. So that we have a growing number of dual income households, which are often uh, on permanent incomes, and a growing number of uh, very uh, weakly remunerated households which can't plan much for the future. And this then has a feedback effect because it puts further pressure on firms. Dual income households are income rich and time poor and they will then draw labour in to try and solve that problem. And you'll have a growing number of time rich but income poor households that just can't afford to buy the basic goods they need. And that onward cycle of deeping inequality continues and that's, that's the cycle we're currently on. The period we're currently living through now is economic development based on deepening inequality. And that's been actively pursued as an act of policy for the last 30 years. The end result of that has been the crisis we've been living through for the last 12 months or so. And Marx gives us the tools uh, to work this out. Now this is all spelled out for those of you who are interested in the introduction of Marx's contribution of, to a critique of political economy. And you'll see it has major echoes of Keynes's theory of effective demand. So, we've talked about Marx's disposition, we've talked about the analytical leads he offers. What about his analytical mode? This is the more academic part of the presentation. So, for those of you who don't like academics, you can turn off now. But uh, he had a very interesting take on how one conducts social science. And it was what, was what would be called today pragmatic realism. He assumed there was a reality out there. He assumed that categories could be used for understanding that reality. And what was particularly useful was that he said you had to immerse yourself in the empirical. In fact, um, Richard Johnson says he had an immense appetite for the empirical. In fact, you couldn't get him away from books of statistics, so called the blue books then. He spent a lot of time in the um, British Library just reading facts after fact after fact. And he would then use his categories to elucidate what those facts actually meant. So this is uh, the flow that he would have. Immerse yourself in the data conduct a historical analysis, a structural analysis, write it up and present it, try to validate it through practice and then continue the research to deepen it. And so his works, when you watch them over time, evolve around that kind of cycle. For those of you who want to see more on Marx's method, there's an excellent essay written by Richard Johnson called Reading for the Best Marx, which spells this out very nicely. Now I want to give you an example of how does this actually work. That all sounds pretty abstract, but I'm going to give you an example from applied research we've done in our centre. Uh, in the early 2000s, it was well known that there were um, skill shortages in the manufacturing sector. And our centre was uh, approached to help the Victorian government answer the question, what are going to be the future needs 
of the uh, Victorian uh, manufacturing industries. And we, were, we put up a research design which said, well, to answer this question, we're going to have to get all the data we can possibly get. So we got all the ABS data on manufacturing. But we also said we had to go out and visit workplaces. We had to go out and visit factories, and we had to interview workers, frontline supervisors, and the like. If you like, this was our data immersorisation stage. And as a result of this um, immersion in the data, we came out with these findings. The first one was the problem wasn't thinking about what are the future needs of Victorian manufacturing. When we actually talked to the frontline supervisors, they said, don't talk to me about what I need in five or ten years' time. I'm having difficulty reproducing the skills I need tomorrow. And a dynamic had emerged, and we documented this quite exhaustively, that um, margins were so tight that any capacity for quiet time to develop skills had been driven out of the system. And this had led to a logic which was akin to farmers eating their seeds. The generation of managers that we have today are a lot relying on the skills that have been bequeathed by an earlier generation. You can do that for a while, but like a farmer who eats their seeds, you've got nothing to, to follow up. You, if you haven't invested it in the ground, you've got nothing to reap in the future. Second thing we found was a breakdown in orderly systems of on and off the job training. So in one of the big food plants we visited, this had previously been a, a, a factory that had won awards for its systems of, on, of linking on and off the job training. These had broken down completely since the company had been taken over and head office had said the priority now is shareholder value. Training is a luxury we can't afford. Just give us the returns. The, th the third major empirical finding was that new organisational forms were changing the way in which skills were developed. And the classic example we found here was in aeronautical engineering, where uh, companies had stripped out their own apprenticeship systems and they just simply wanted to hire in tradespeople to do a particular job. Labour hire companies were sent in to, draw, to provide the labour that was needed at any particular time. But the labour hire companies were not the villains in this case. The labour hire companies recognised that if they wanted to have skilled engineers into the future, they had to have apprentices on site. And the host employer said, don't show us an apprentice, you pay for them, we don't. So we actually found that the labour hire companies lied. They called their apprentices trades assistants. And that was how intense the pressure had become, that labour hire companies were the champions for reproducing skills because the cycle and the, the commitment to having new organisational forms around displacing costs uh, had become so intense that it was only by lying that they could keep their training rates up. Finally, and most importantly, we discovered that large workplaces were the source of most of the problems. If you look at the data on the apprenticeship system, there hasn't been a collapse in the number of four-year trained apprentices. There's been a huge number in uh, rising trainees, but there has been a collapse in four-year trained apprentices. All of that, all of that has come from the big end of town. Small and medium-sized employees are taking on as many apprentices as they ever have. It's the Business Council of Australia's companies and it's the old government instrumentalities that are no longer playing it. So there you have it. My team came back and said, John, that's what we found. And I said, so what? Because simply having a big pile of facts there doesn't help you get very far. And so this is where we went back to Brenner and said, well, we reckon excess capacity is having an impact here. It's arising from intense competition and that's having direct and indirect effects on skills. The direct effects of the farmers eating their seeds and the breakdown of on and off the job means of communication, and the indirect effects are coming through new organisational forms and the role of large capital. What are the implications of this? Well, it means there's limited capacity for new skill requirements to be met, and equally, even established skill requirements uh, can't be met. But what we did find in our field work that some Victorian places, Victorian workplaces, had identified new ways to handle this problem of risk and cost. And the classic example we found was in a group training arrangements where companies had got together and taken collective responsibility for apprentices. So if one company could not keep the apprentice fully employed, they could share them with another employer and in that way keep the overall training rates up in an industry or a region going, even though at any one point in time no one employer could guarantee continuity of engagement for four years. So having identified this cycle, we said, there are two scenarios possible. The first is the dynamic of farmers eating their seed could continue and you would basically have a downward steady slide in manufacturing. We were writing this in 2002. Unfortunately, scenario B has appeared to prevail. It was, however, not the only one that was possible. 
There could have been an upward spiral where you would have a turning of the tide by building new training capacity and modernising existing capacity, and that way you could renew and revitalise growth in manufacturing. Now, that's all a long way of saying you can use Marx's method of using abstractions to make sense of deeply empirical data to make sense of what is otherwise a quite confusing and bewildering story. What about his method of presentation? Well, it's very important to um, reflect when you read Marx, you are, and particularly if you have a look at Capital, it's actually a remarkable text to read because, <laughs> call me a bit of a tragic, but I look at footnotes. I mean, Marx's footnotes are like no one else's one's ever seen. There's footnotes in raw Greek, in Latin. Now, this isn't Marx being a show-off. When I first read it as an undergraduate, I thought, boy, what, a, what an egghead. No, but what... It, what uh, Francis Wien argues, and it's a, it's a very profound point, that he wasn't a show-off. He was smart and he was arrogant and all that. But he actually wasn't a show-off. What Marx was doing, and he actually mentioned this on a number of occasions, he would not release his text capital, and it was 20 years late to the publisher. Let's not forget that. It was a, you know, they, they were very patient publishers. It was a very, he said, I'm not going to release it until I've grasped the artistic whole. And this is something really important to keep in mind because Marx is often talked about as a social scientist or, a, uh, or as a politico, but he actually wanted to grasp capitalism in its totality and he used every mode of human um, understanding to do that. And that included literary appropriations of reality. So you'll see references to um, you know, the, the ancient Greek legends. You'll see references to, to German and French and uh, English literature as well as the classic political economists and the like. And so this method of presentation is something in its own right. People often ignore it because they're trying to get to the tendency of the theory of the rate of profit to fall or they're trying to get to the theory of commodities. But that's actually embedded in an organic whole. And um, Francis Wien actually argues capital is the best Gothic tragedy ever written. So, now, that's a big call, but I think it, uh, it gives you an insight into what the, the, the genius of Marx was. Now, the, 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 uh, the downside. What are the analytical closures? There's absolutely no doubt that Marx did have some problems. And most of these were a kind of technicist or reductionist view of tendencies within the system. And this is the problem he shared with liberals of the time, Adam Smith especially. There was a notion that uh, as capitalism evolved, it was going to have uh, a fairly almost uh, mechanistic uh, evolution, which was going to completely fragment and destroy um, coherent skills. And humans would simply become little ants in a huge machine that uh, Marx called um, capitalism. And Adam Smith, in the opening pages of The Wealth of Nations, does, uh, explores the, the, the pin factory. He talks about the 18 different uh, operations that are underway. And this was seen as an inevitable but necessary part of human progress. Now, this is an incredibly limiting way of looking at how human society evolves. And it means political and uh, uh, economic leaders can ignore all kinds of degradations in the place of work because if it's all in the name of progress, we're all going to get better in the end. Now, it's been quite... Um, convincingly shown that this, is, this common problem in Marx and Smith is one that can be overcome by making the simple distinction that the technical division of labour does not have to correspond with the social division of labour. And if you want a, a very crystal clear example of this, think of a car that is produced in Japan and think of a car that is produced in Sweden. They're both cars, but they've been produced un under completely different social relations of production. If you look at a Toyota that comes out of Japan, only 15% of the value added in that car has actually come from Toyota. The other 18% has been subcontract. Sorry, the other 85% has been subcontracted in. When you look at the European uh, manufacturers, a far greater proportion of them is put out by BMW or Mercedes or Volvo. It's actually done in house as part of an integrated production process. Uh, also uh, important in this regard is. Um, Bianacchi, Richard Bianacchi has written a very famous book or very important book called The Fabrication of Labour and he says if we want to understand the cultural influences on labour as a commodity we've got to look at three fundamental forces because he says when uh, you analyse labour as a commodity it is in fact 
not fixed. And I've already shown you that already with the debate around non-standard work. We're already seeing that in Australia. The commodity of formal labour is not fixed. It evolves quite radically. Bianacchi looks, compares England and Germany from 1640 to 1914. And he argues that in, in, in England there was a notion that labour was a discrete object that was embodied in the product that was produced. And he goes through all manner of ways of showing this. To give you a crystal clear example of what it means, for industrial action in uh, England, the main thing was for labour to separate itself from the point of production. That's why strikes were so important. You still have the expression today, going out on the grass. They actually physically removed themselves from the point of production so that they couldn't be embodied in it. Germany, on the other hand, had a very different concept of labour. This is a, a mass understanding. It's not just workers, it's employers as well. In Germany, the notion of labour was this, that what the employer hired was the capacity for the worker to do work. The actual realisation of that potential on the job was a question that had to be determined in the workplace, often through negotiation. This is called the open-ended nature of the uh, employment contract. Now Marx, that's a Marxist conception of labour and that's called the labour process problem. But Bianacchi shows that was not the English conception of labour. And he actually shows, and it's the best part of the book, English translators couldn't work out what Marx was getting at when he was talking about the labour process problem in the 1880s. In fact, it took him about 15 years to finally work it out. Now this is a sign that the analytical closures of Marx can be overcome. They're quite deep. That, that fusion of the technical and social division of labour is quite deep. But that is not catastrophic for his way of reasoning. You can actually use the underlying principles of his thought to overcome the closures. So what do we conclude? Why is Marx still relevant and so exciting? Well, from my, from my point of view, his analytical predisposition opens up a huge amount of space. That idea of paradox, that idea that why do property relations have to be the way they are? That is incredibly liberating. Very simple um, insights go a long way. His analytical categories take us even further. The insights about historical materialism are not necessarily having the causality that is assumed to run with them, but they are very powerful categories. Projective consciousness, forces of production, relations of production, superstructure. You don't necessarily have to assume causality runs one way, but having those underlying principles to organise your data helps you really make sense of what's going on. And then finally, his analytical approach, I think that link between theory, data and practice is almost without equal. That practical um, realism in its uh, take on epistemology and his insights about using um, literary modes of reasoning, it's a very important way of making sense of a complex world. On the downside, there are problems with Marx's analytical thoughts, but I don't think, as I said, they're catastrophic. They can be transcended. So the conclusion is Marx offers us powerful pointers for understanding the past and the present to better guide the struggle for social justice in the future. Thank you. <laughs>